So this next example we're going to look at is a little bit more sophisticated than the ones we've looked at so far. The ones we looked at so far were really just showing off various Java functional programming features like Lambda expressions and method references and functional interfaces. Now we're going to take a look at another example, which will showcase and benchmark various types of maps in Java. We'll use a concurrent hash map, a synchronized map, which are things that come out of the box, as well as a hash map that we implement using a Java stamp lock in order to compute, cache, and retrieve large prime numbers. And this example will also demonstrate the use of Java records, which is a very interesting new data type that's come with Java 16. Several advanced features of stamp lock, which we will not talk about in this class because it's really for a different class to talk about synchronizers. And then I'll show you a little use of slicing with Java streams, take while and drop while operations, which are some pretty cool stateful uh, short circuiting operations that come defined with modern Java. So here's the example. It has a couple of fields that keep track of the number of calls to check whether a number is prime. And we're going to use that to demonstrate how caching can, can be useful. We use the maps for caching, by the way. We're also going to keep track of the number of pending items that we need to process. And then we keep ourselves a list of randomly generated large integers. And we keep this list because we want the input for the different uh, synchronized or different concurrent hash maps to always be working on the same input so we can compare apples to apples. The main program creates an instance of this class passing in argv and then runs it. Here's the constructor. It's going to go ahead and parse the command line arguments. As, as is almost off, often the case in my programs, I have an options singleton that can be used to set various command line parameters. We won't spend a lot of time talking about that right now. It's not important for this example at the moment, but we parse the arguments and then we generate random data. So let's go ahead and see how we generate random data. And, and the purpose of this example is to kind of illustrate some cool Java streams features. So we, we use our options singleton to figure out how many integers we should generate and what the maximum value is for the random integers that we're generating. And then we use a cool helper method that's been added from Java 8 onwards in the random class. There's a, there's a random ints method that generates count number of ints from the range, whatever the lower bound is, up to the upper bound. So the lower bound will be the max value minus count and up to the max value. And the reason we do it that way is because we're trying to generate duplicates. We want to have duplicate numbers because we want to demonstrate the benefits of caching, which is a technique called memoization. Ints returns a stream of primitive values. So we go ahead and box those values up into be integer instead of int, and then we collect them into a list. So we end up creating the results of generate random data returns a list to randomly generated integers within this range that are boxed up and stored in an array list. So if you recall, uh, as you watch the videos about Java streams, you'll learn about terminal operations. Collect is a terminal operation, and we give it, in this case, a collector, which, which is going to be a list collector, and it'll collect the elements of the stream into a list. So once we've got all that stuff, then we can run the program. And the run code is pretty cool. We're going to make ourselves a stamped lock hash map. Uh, like I said, I won't talk too much about that other than it's just a, a hash map that's synchronized using stamped locks, which are a very cool synchronization primitive that was added in Java 8. And it supports various cool modes like uh, conditional writes and optimistic reads and lockup grading and all this good stuff. So that's a topic for another day. We then go ahead and we'll run timing tests of something called a memoizer. And I'll talk a bit about a memoizer in a second. And a memoizer is just a, basically it's a, it's a cache that remembers values. So if you look something up by a key and the value has not been computed, then the function that's passed in here as the parameter, the first parameter to memoizer will be used to compute a value that's associated with the key. And then that value will be stored in the map. If you come back later and ask for that same key, rather than having to recompute the function, it will then just simply go ahead and return the existing value that's been memoized or remembered or cached. Probably a better way to say it is cached. Memoization is just a fancy way of saying get cached. And this particular 
example, will create three different kinds of memoizers. They all will check to see if a number is prime, and they're going to use three different kinds of maps. One of them is going to use the so-called synchronized map, which just wraps a non-synchronized map, like a hash map or a hash uh, tree or whatnot, in a synchronized object, which has a single synchronizer. So there's one lock for all the threads that will be using it. And then the second example here will create a memoizer that passes in the same is prime function. And however, it creates a concurrent hash map, which is very, very heavily optimized to work efficiently when you have many threads and many cores compared to synchronized map, which only has one synchronizer. Concurrent hash map has a separate synchronizer for every, every basically uh, bucket in the hash table, if you're familiar with bucket chaining. Every bucket has its own synchronizer. So things that hash to different locations in the hash table can all run in parallel. And then we create a third uh, example down here, which we use the stamped lock hash map, which again, I won't talk about, but it's another implementation of a, a concurrent hash map that uses stamp lock instead of what comes out of the box with concurrent hash map. All those things will then start to run. And then we're going to go ahead and figure out how long they took to run and we'll print out the ones that ran fastest, they, they come out in the order from fastest to slowest, you'll see that in a second. And then we're also going to demonstrate some slicing on the results from the stamp block hash map. So let's take a look at some of the other pieces of code. This is some really fun stuff. So here's a method called time test where you pass it a memoizer and a name. And we use this cool little helper method I have called time run. And what time run does is it starts a timer. You can see it's past the supplier. It says, hey, supplier, do your thing, whatever your thing is. And it'll go ahead and do its computation. When it's done, it stops the timer. And then it puts the execution time into the results map under that name. So that'll basically go ahead and figure out how long it took to run that particular operation. And to do this, we call the run test method with the memoizer and the test name. And you can see here's what run test does. So run test is kind of a cool little method. As you can see, it's going to run the prime number test with different memoizer implementations. And then we're going to see which one wins. So we reset the counter that keeps track of the number of prime number checks we've done. And then we're going to have a cool little stream here that will publish a stream of random large numbers. And we're going to dynamically decide if we're running this thing in parallel or not. We can run it sequentially, or we can run it in parallel. By default, it runs in parallel. We'll take a look and see how that works. So for every item in the stream, it's going to be a parallel stream if parallel is set. Otherwise, it's going to be a sequential stream. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. We're then going to use the peak operation to basically print out values if we're debugging. So if we're in debugging mode, we'll print some intermediate results. And then here's kind of the workhorse of the whole stream. For each number that we generated, we're going to call the check if prime value, passing in the number and the memoizer. And this is what this looks like. So here's what check if prime does. Check if prime will create a new print result. And I'll show you what a print result is in a second. It's pretty cool. That's going to pass in the prime number candidate, right? We just have a large number. We want to know, is it prime? And then we're going to pass in the results of applying the memoizer to the prime candidate. And what that's going to do is if we've not encountered this prime candidate before, the memoizer will go ahead and call the is prime method. And we'll take a look and see what that does in a second to compute whether it's prime or not. If it's prime, the is prime method returns zero. If it's not prime, is prime returns its smallest factor. However, if we've already computed the value of that prime candidate, rather than go through the extensive and expensive recomputation of whether it's prime or not to check its primality, the map, the memoizer will just return the result that had been cached before. So that's why we wanted duplicates to be able to get the benefits of caching. Now, what is prime result? Well, prime result's pretty cool. You may or may not be familiar with this, but with later versions of Java, certainly in Java 16, it may have started to appear in Java 15, but I think Java 16 really nailed it down. There's a new data type constructor called a record. And a record is distinct from an object. And the reason a record is distinct from an object is unlike an object, which pulls along a whole bunch of other state, things like a, uh, a mutex and a condition variable and other stuff and a bunch of other methods and so on. So it's a little, little heavier weight than you might want. A record is kind of like a struct in C. 
it just stores data. It just stores plain old data, sometimes called a pod. And in this case, the record is going to store the prime candidate and the smallest factor. Those are going to be the two things it stores. And if you look at record, it's got this really weird syntax because it looks like it's a function. <laughs> it looks like we're defining parameters to a function, but in fact, we're defining fields in a record. And I'll show you how you can access those fields when we go back and see how it's used. So that's basically what a prime result is. So I have check a your quick prime, question. return that. Yeah. Are those records, are the, is there automatic like serialization and deserialization because they're just data? Does that make sense? Uh, you're asking if you try to send them over the network? No, no, like serialized to disk or something. Like, is there, or, or to JSON, you know, is there a way that you can automatically change them into a different thing? Uh, I don't, I mean, there's, there's ways of automatically doing it. I don't think they come built in, you know, in the, the class, that, the, the generated class, but it's easy to use that with all the other stuff in Java that knows how to serialize and deserialize things. Okay, cool, thanks. Sure. So if you take a look here, we have prime result. That's what's returned from check if prime. And so check if prime will take a, it'll return a prime result. So map takes in a stream of random integers and returns a stream of prime result objects. And then for each of those results, we call handle result. And so here's what handle result does. You can see handle results takes a prime result. And this is how you access the fields of the, the records. You just say result dot smallest factor, open close, that gets the smallest factor field. Likewise, you can see here result dot prime candidate, that'll get the value of the prime candidate field and so on and so forth. So that's basically what we're doing to compute this. And then down here is the is prime method. As you can see, you give it a prime integer and it goes ahead and does an intentionally inefficient algorithm to check to see whether something's prime. And we make it intentionally inefficient just to burn CPU, thereby increasing the benefits of memoization and caching. The last piece of the puzzle here is this thing called demonstrate slicing. And this is really cool. So we're gonna give it the map that we've created that has this mapping between uh, prime, prime candidates and prime values. And we're going to go ahead and sort the map by value. So the map is then gonna be sorted by value. We'll see what that looks like in a second. So the values that are uh, the smallest values will come first followed by the bigger values. And so everything that has the value of zero, of course, will have been a prime number. And everything that has a value greater than zero will have been a non-prime number. So it'll be ordered in that way. And then we're gonna go ahead and print out the primes, which of course will be from you know, the beginning of the, the uh, map up to the point where you don't have a zero because those are the primes. And then we're gonna print the non-primes. And that will be from the part of the map that doesn't have a zero value to the end of the map. So this is gonna demonstrate a whole bunch of other cool little features. So let's first go ahead and see how we can sort the map. So to sort the map, we're gonna take a comparator, which in this case is gonna be comparing by value. We're gonna turn the map into an entry set, which just creates a set that is going to be mapping the key value pairs, which in this case will be integer to integer. We then convert the entry set into a stream of map entries, which are key value pairs. We're then gonna use the sorted method, which is something that comes from stream, and that will be sorting based on comparator. And so in that particular case, the comparator is going to be compare, it's going to compare values. So it'll sort by value. You could also sort by key, but we're going to sort by value. And then the final thing we do, this is really cool. We collect the stream of sorted map entry objects, and we convert the stream into a map where the key will be used, the, the key and the key entry will be used as the key in the map. The value will be used as the value in the map. And we're going to use the linked hash map map implementation in order to implement the map. And so we're gonna pass in linked hash map colon colon new, which is a constructor reference that will make a map that is implemented as a linked hash map. And the reason we use linked hash map is that a linked hash map will preserve the order in which the items are added into the map. Uh, the map will of course hash to wherever it hashes to, but it'll keep track of the order in which the items were added. And therefore, when we iterate through the map, they'll end up in the order they were added, which in this case is the sorted order, 
rather than the order in which they were hashed. So that's just a, another little cool tidbit of trivia about uh, how to create maps using collect. So we're using the two map collector to create a map that's the sorted map that will keep track of the sort order because it's a linked hash map. So we sort the map and then we're gonna print the primes. Let's go see how we print the primes. So print prime is gonna take the sorted map and it's going to create an entry set of the sorted map. It'll create a stream. So we have a stream of entries. Keep in mind they're sorted. And then we're gonna use the take while method. And take while is a uh, stateful short circuiting operation which will keep taking the elements in the stream, in other words, considering them, processing them, up to the point where the predicate no longer matches. So what we're doing, we're basically saying, as long as the values in the map are zero, process them. And of course, what we're doing there is we're saying that we're going to uh, basically only consider the values in the stream that are primes, because their value will be zero, because they didn't have a smallest factor. So we ignore everything else, we only take the primes, and then we go ahead and get rid of everything except the key. So we winnow out, we get rid of the value, just have the key. And then we collect the results into a list and we print the list of prime numbers. So that's where that will come from. And then to print the non-prime numbers, we simply use a similar approach, except rather than using take while, we're gonna use drop while. And drop while is another short circuiting, stateful stream operation, which says ignore elements until, uh, well, ignore elements that match the predicate. So what we basically say here is skip over everything that doesn't, skip over everything that's a prime number and then start dealing with the rest of the stream after you've hit that. So what we're basically doing there is we're printing out the rest of the items, which are the, the mappings of the, uh, the, the prime candidates to their smallest factor. So armed with all that information now, we can run the program and see what it does. It, it goes ahead and cranks away for a while. I, now that we turn parallel processing on, the concurrent hash map, which is super duper optimized for concurrent processing is way fastest, way the faster. And then the other ones are roughly about the same um, with synchronized hash map kind of lagging in third. 